I think it was an exciting time in one sense because we are just a few months past the commercial approval of Dylan Dishogene Moxaparvavac for Duchenne in the United States. Um, but it's not really been enough time to get any real world data or experience together in terms of academic presentation. So it's certainly a hot topic in the hallway conversations, but not a lot of objective data. We're eagerly anticipating the uh, upcoming data cut for the Embark study, which was the um, four to eight year old ambulatory Duchenne study by Sarepta of the uh, precursor to Dylan Dystrogene Moxaparvavec, um, which is anticipated in November um, and will likely lead to a broadening of the label in the United States. And I'm sure regulators around the world are also watching closely related to their decision making process around that particular gene transfer therapy as that cut will tell us whether um, there was a statistically significant difference between the treated group versus placebo in the phase three study. The interim uh, data from phase one two uh, study called Affinity Duchenne, which is a gene transfer therapy study uh, by uh, Region X Bio, was presented. Um, it included boys ages four to 11 uh, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and who were um, ambulatory. The interim results on three boys were um, presented. And the first boy was dosed at age four years, and the second boy was dosed at age 10 years. and um, and there was also a, a third one who was dosed um, at age six. Um, so the dystrophin expression data was presented on the first two boys, the, you know, the four-year-old and the 10-year-old. The four-year-old had a microdystrophin expression of about 38.8% of normal dystrophin levels at three months post-dosing. And the, the second boy, the 10-year-old, had about 11% of normal um, dystrophin levels expression at um, three months after um, dosing. And I, I think, you know, the safety um, profile was encouraging. Um, both of those boys did not have any um, serious uh, adverse effects from the um, therapy. And then there were um, some update of the, uh, the trial conducted by uh, Pfizer and some uh, news about a new uh, potential compound like the one that is developed by Regenix Bio. Uh, and there was a very interesting communication that was presented as a late breaking news um, from the team of Ohio. Um, and this is about a, a, a slightly different way, which is uh, using an AV and a U7 construct that helps to, in an RNA construct that helps to, to skip um, the exon 2 of patients who have duplication of the exon 2. And the, the very interesting part was that um, in, in this trial, they infused the kid who was eight months old. Um, and this kid is, is one year later doing remarkably well with a CK level that are uh, close to normal and, and a kid who is developing um, well with a, a expression of, of this truffin, which is close to 100%. Um, obviously, this is a, a very interesting result. Of, of course, we, we, we need to figure out what's going to be the long term uh, outcome for, for such a young patient, um, included that young, uh, but this certainly opens new avenue of thinking um, about the best age to infuse um, uh, gene therapy. Another interesting question um, that was um, answered during the Congress is the, the prevalence of antibodies against ARV RH74 um, in the overall population, but also in the population of parents um, of kids who have been um, injected with it, infused with the gene therapy, and also uh, from uh, caregivers and HCP uh, who are exposed to gene therapy. And actually, uh, yes, there is the prevalence is, is slightly higher, but not, you know, much higher. It, it, it can be twice for HCP who are exposed to gene therapy in comparison with, with other HCP. So altogether, uh, it seems that, that the immunization of, 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 pay, of, of, of people who are around the patients uh, remain relatively low.